2013 marks a very important anniversary in the calendar for Rosalind Turek, for it's 100 years since her birth and 10 years since her death. At the Turek Bach Research Institute, we wanted to share with you the testimonials, the memories, the anecdotes of seven personalities who were very closely associated with Rosalind Turek during her life. Each of these people knew Rosalind at a different time and in a different context. And they want to share with you these memories, these anecdotes, so that you can get an impression of who was Rosalind Turek and the influence that she had on so many people. It was 1944 or 45, I was 11 years old. I auditioned for her to be a, her piano student. She was at first quite reluctant to consider a student so young. She only taught college age students. My father had, been, had her recommended to him by a, a friend who was a musician, and he was very persuasive. And he finally got her to agree to at least meet and hear me play. And when she did, she accepted me as a student. I was her youngest piano pupil. I don't remember the audition actually. I guess I was so nervous I blanked it out. But I remember her lessons very well. They were wonderful. Well, she was a towering figure. I put her on a pedestal. She was the first performing artist I had ever met. And I was in awe of her. Uh, she was magnificent on the stage, cool, calm, and collected. And, but she gave me a sense of the musical responsibility and also gave me what I needed as a young piano student, Bach, Handel, Scarlatti, and also scholarship. One of the first things she had me, my family buy was the Groves Dictionary of Music and Musicians, so that scholarship all worked in. I also was given these fiendishly finger-twisting piano exercises by Doch uh, for independence and strength, which is what I needed very much at that time. I attended her recitals. One I remember vividly was Town Hall. Uh, it was 1945, November 12th, a mixed program. Two Bach Preludes and Fugues, book one, book one, one, book two, a Mozart sonata, Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata, Copland's Piano Sonata with the composer present, and he shared the bows, and her signature Brahms variations on a theme by Handel. I was fascinated with the performance process, and I asked her, do you, do you ever get nervous before a performance? And she, her answer stays with me today. Uh, she said, a performance is always a performance. Uh, when I became a professional orchestra and opera conductor, I, I understood just what she meant. She was always seeking perfection. She worked with great focus and seriousness and, and very hard. And that was her character and her musical trait. She also was seeking to portray faithfully the musical styles of everything she played. She played not only Bach, although she did that superbly and focused on it, but she also did music of her time, music of romantic music, and she was very versatile, and she always sought to, to play this music in its character, in its style. Inspiring. Well, I mentioned about scholarship and the Groves Dictionary, and always be pursuing or texts and, and, and editions. I heard her perform not only that one time in town hall, but I heard her perform privately before she had public performances. And it was just the, the dedication and the, uh, the professionalism impressed me just greatly. Uh, I attended her concerts all, all throughout her career, and uh, she was very pleased and proud of me being, becoming a musician, a conductor. And I was able to have the great honor and pleasure of inviting her to be a soloist with me, with my orchestras and music festivals. And she, in turn, invited me to conduct two Bach cantatas on the six concert series in Carnegie Hall that she produced 
uh, in, in honor of the 300th anniversary of Bach's birth in March 1985. She probably remains somewhat controversial. Uh, she was original, she was unique. Uh, but this is a very territorial field and everyone has their own viewpoint and feels threatened by anyone else. But the example that she set of seeking the earliest editions and she's researched all over libraries all over the world, particularly in Bach, traveling to places where Bach had been. And so this thoroughness uh, and that depth is an example uh, to emulate and to admire. And her performances stand for themselves, the clarity, the articulation, the voicing. These are some things that you can learn from all the time. There is always the things new to be learned and uh, in this field, but she took advantage of every possibility in her lifetime and wrote up most everything very scholarly uh, of her findings. I'd ask her about the chromatic fantasy and fugue of Bach. Uh, the Turek Bach Research Institute has given grants and awarded to a very fine young Spanish musicologist, scholar, pianist, Juan Elias Castañera, to assemble and to document her writings, uh, particularly those of her unfinished uh, edition of the chromatic fantasy and fugue, which will never be definitively finished. So, uh, but he's going to write, the, he's written these articles and they'll be posted on our website of the Institute. But in that one minute, I would ask Dr. Turek for her final version. And it would only take less than a minute to ask and all the time in the world to enjoy and to reveal, revel in her answer, which would be just uh, revelatory. Well, actually, I felt like I knew Rosalind Turek all my life, because as a boy, I had listened to recordings that she had made at that time for uh, CBS Masterworks of Bach. But how I met her for real, in person, was an encounter in 1997, February, when I was at that time, I was vice president of Polygram International and Deutsche Grammophon. And I was introduced to her by a very dear colleague of mine, Tom Deacon, who took me to Oxford to see her and said, there's a lady you just have to meet. You and, you and this woman will hit it off. I said, who is it? He said, Rosalind Turek. I said, absolutely. And I met her there, and that became the moment of our friendship and also professional relationship, whereby I proposed to her the idea to make a comeback, so to say, and make the recording that she made at the age of 86 of the Bach Goldberg Variations for Deutsche Grammophon. Oh, this was a big personality, a very big personality, who had an aura and a charisma that you could feel from a mile away. Um, the first thing that struck me was her way of intensely looking at you and listening to every word that you said. And nothing was sort of frivolous, nothing was superficial. So I would say an extremely rigorous and an extremely probing mind, an intellectually curious person. Well, yes, it's a bit, it's bittersweet, in fact. When she knew that she was going to die at the end of her life, in her true typical style, very matter of fact and very direct and very straightforward, she called me and she told me that she was terminally ill. And it was almost hard to imagine the way she was expressing it on the phone because it was as if she was talking about someone else, but she was talking about herself. And she said to me, I accept all these things, I accept the, I accept death. She said, but I can't accept not existing in a physical sense. Let's talk about that. 
again in a very intellectual context. And that was shocking to me. Here was a woman who knew she was terminally ill, yet approached even that in a very intellectual and a very sort of, a, she wanted to have a debate with me on the phone about that. And I found that absolutely astounding, but true to her character. I think her personality was so rigorous, so uncompromising. I would use the word uncompromising, and I would say uncompromising both in the sense of a character trait as well in the sense of a musical trait. Nothing was done without thought. Nothing was done without reason. So I would say uncompromising and probing both musically and as a person. Hmm. I would say rigorous, rigorous. I would link the two, since I am not a performing professional performing musician, although I play music. Uh, I would say that she taught me through endless discussions that I had with her. And I used to go to visit her in Oxford on Saturdays and spend the whole day just talking to her. And we used to have telephone calls lasting hours sometimes. She taught me, I would say, how to be analytical, how to see things very clear a clarity of thought, and to apply a clarity of thought in everything we do, whether that is in our daily routines, or whether it is in approaching music, judging music, judging musicians, to be, as she was, uncompromising and extremely honest and rigorous to everything that you looked at and uh, thought of. I think her role will be, certainly up until this time, there are few who could say to be scholars and performers to the level that she was, because often people are one or the other. And she almost goes back to a Renaissance woman, in a sense, of being someone who analyzed, wrote, and performed. And she was able to connect all these things together and to, f to create synergies and links between performance, scholarship, analysis, research. And what was most interesting about her, I think, was the fact that she believed everything is interconnected. So she had a curiosity and an intellectual curiosity to speak with mathematicians, physicists, botanists, chemists, doctors, lawyers, to find parallel points between music and other disciplines. And that was to me something that I think will, has marked her and will sort of influence. She created a publication called Interactions where she actually created symposiums where she invited great personalities, among others the very respected uh, personality uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, who is the famous creator of fractal geometry and fractal theory. And she was fascinated by that to find the parallels between fractals and the music of Bach. So she believed you could create links and have synergies between everything, that everything was interconnected. And I think that will be one of the points where she has really left her mark. I would want to tell her because of that one which I mentioned earlier, her fear of not existing in the physical sense. And I tried to reassure her and I said, you have left so much and you've contributed so much to humanity through your writings, through your films that you made, and through your recordings, that you will live on. Albeit you're not here with us physically, but you live on because what you, your approach to Bach, your approach to music in general, will mark generations and generations to come. And I think that reassured her, but I also think it's true, and I, wanted, I would tell her now if I could see her, it's the case, it's true, you do live on.
a pleasure to do. And please forgive me if I talk at some length. When I went to high school in East Flatbush, there were about 6,000 students, 95 of us were, 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 came from Jewish homes, and the symphonic band and the orchestra numbered, I would say, the band numbered 110 and the orchestra about 100. Every single day, I would have lunch with a group of the musicians, uh, and we would always talk about music, and what we heard on WQXR the night before. These were the days when the New York Times every single day had a, um, or I guess all of the radio stations uh, listed what they were going to be doing. So we, first thing we did was wake up in the morning, have breakfast, rush to school, and make sure that we heard who and what was going to be played. So those were always great times. This, this was probably how I first heard of Rosalind Turek. I would imagine it must have been in the late 50s and in the early 60s. And uh, we always, of course, listened to her recordings. My father always was bringing home records. And we were always listening on the radio. Then, one day in a session of the orchestra, it was my junior year then, not my senior year, because my wife and I were already dating, so we were 16, 17 years old, a fellow by the name of Alfred R. Weil, who happened to have been the uh, associate editor of Piano Quarterly, it turned out to be many, many years later. He took out two tickets from his vest and he said, has anybody here ever heard of a woman who was known as the High Priestess of Bach. And I said, absolutely, of course, sure. Her name is Rosalind Turek. He said, would you like two tickets? And Sylvia and I went to one of our first piano recitals together, which, of course, has been a relationship. Uh, we've been married for uh, 43 years. So that was the first time that I actually saw her in, in public. How did I get to know her? The very first time I encountered her, she was walking with a friend of hers whose name was Marshall Chrysler. He was a member of the temple uh, and a piano teacher here in the community. And uh, they were walking together, so I said hello to him, and of course I couldn't resist saying hello to her. So this must have been in the early 1980s. And then when she joined Temple Emmanuel, our relationship grew and grew until I really became what I used to like to call, I was her shamus, I was her sexton. I only lived three blocks away from her. And my wife and I did anything that she asked us to do and to try to make her life easier as she was doing all of her ventures. You know, it's a kind of miraculous thing. When she graduated from high school in Chicago, Chicago, I think, right, Chicago, a member of her class was Saul Bellow. Now, to have a genius like Saul Bellow and a genius like Rosalind Turek both at the same time in your class is really a, quite a remarkable feat for an academic institution. My immediate um, impression of her was, aside from her music, was that she was a genius who was also a musician and a great pianist. But I thought she was a genius on every single level. I have to confess that the first time that she was in my apartment and she, uh, she sat down and she started to play actually the Brahms Handel variations, the very last one with the fugue, uh, this was an old style O that I had, that she hit it so hard, uh, and I never told her this, but the sounding board had to be replaced. So that's... Uh, a, Shows you the power of a great pianist, the, the physical power. There was one night also that she came over for Shabbos dinner, and she said, let's play some four-handed music. We had guests there at the time. She said, do you want to do the Schubert F minor fantasy? I said, yes, let's do the F minor fantasy. And we did, especially at a slow tempo at the, at the end. But I will always remember the fact that I did have a chance to play four-handed music, Schubert with, uh, with Rosalind. Look, she was a great artist, and she had an, an artist's temperament, but uh, I think her greatest strength was her general brilliance. She was brilliant on, on every level. She was a, a, a musician who was also interested in so many other things. Um, she, she read voraciously, and she wrote. Uh, 
I think she was, she, she was, a, she was a super genius. I, I would put her in, in that level. And a, a super genius who was a, a phenomenal pianist. Certainly one of the three greatest uh, female pianists of the 20th century. Genius. Well, she certainly taught me that uh, Johann Sebastian Bach uh, was, was a super genius, of course, himself, and um, that his music needn't be, uh, that his music was applicable to, to any medium, actually. It didn't necessarily have to be a, a clavier. It, it could be anything. And, of course, she taught me how uh, some of the violin concerti were also transposed or transfixed in, into other media. Um, she taught me about, I think, in, in that way, musical flexibility. And she did teach me of something I could have never reached, and that would be her high standards. If I ever had any uh, ideas uh, of ever becoming a concert pianist, which I never really did, I just did it because I loved it, uh, her mastery and her greatness really um, guaranteed me and assured me that I knew what I was doing when I became a rabbi instead of a concert pianist. You know, it's going, it would have to be a very rarefied uh, place because um, she was one individual and, and she was very much her own person. She, she wasn't, I don't think that she was the, uh, the sharing kind with, with large groups. She knew who she was, she knew what she wanted to convey, and she knew how to convey it. I tell her I miss her. And I do. The year was 1941. In October, I was applying for a scholarship in piano at Manus. Uh, dear David Manis was the only person present with Rosalind. She was so warm, encouraging, that she in somehow influenced me to play my very best. So I did get a scholarship in piano with Rosalind Turek, and it's a good thing I did, because I was born a very dear church mice, and had I not had this scholarship, my entire life would have been very different. I owe it all to Rosalind. So after two years of study with her at Manus, um, there was a fateful conversation. Uh, Rosalind and her husband, who'd been living in the suburbs, decided to move to the city. It was wartime, it was difficult to heat the house in the suburbs. And they were taking a large apartment on Riverside Drive, Upper Riverside Drive. And she suggested that in order for me to have more time in New York, go to more concerts, I never could go to a concert because I lived in New Jersey and the commute was frightful at that hour. She suggested that I take a room in their large apartment. It was a very fateful suggestion. Uh, for a year, it was just that. I really had very little to do with them. I got up in the morning, made my breakfast, went out for the day, went to Manus, um, taught some. And after a year, unfortunately, they separated and divorced. And that was the beginning of an experience of unfounded trust on her part, an unanticipated experience on mine. Before I talk about some of the details of that, let me say that when I would come home from Manus or from teaching on Wednesdays in the late afternoon, there would be Rosalind having finished her teaching, and she'd say to me, Oh, that dear little boy, he's so sweet, he's so talented. 
I never knew who the little boy was, and I never saw the little boy. It was sort of like reverse daddy long legs, if you know that childhood story. Many years later, decades later, Rosalind asked me to go to a matinee concert and have dinner with her afterwards. And she said, isn't that nice about Michael Cherry? I said, who? Well, he's had, I forget what it was, some important triumph or appointment. That was the little boy. <laughs> so, uh, so much for Michael. But I'm, I always remember that. Now, um, little by little, I seem to be given all kinds of responsibilities. Suddenly, I was editing and typing Bach lectures. Well, that's fine. I learned a great deal from that. Suddenly, I was dealing with her manager. I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't yet 20 years old. Um, I had some very interesting experiences because of the people she invited to the house. For example, when David Diamond composed a sonata for her, he, of course, came by frequently to consult with her about what was going on keyboardistically. He would stay for dinner. And once I came home and found a note on the kitchen table which said, such and such is almost ready, but please add cloves. And I found in my collection of letters of her, which I've been going through lately, a little drawing she made on a little scrap of paper of a clove so that I'd be sure to know what a clove was. <laughs> I mean, she was very, very precise, you see. Well, I would say that the person I met on that October 1941 day was a very different person from the grand dame into whom she evolved and whom we all got to know in later years. Quite possibly, quite probably, the seeds were there. But I think having someone to facilitate her work, which of course her husband had been doing, he wasn't a musician, but he was very good at the business end of things, having someone who was constant and reliable and trusted, trusted, helped her. And after I left, which was five years later, she had a strength in not only demanding the most from herself, but also knowing how to extract the most from other people. Too many. Because when you live in the same home with someone for five years, many, many, many things happen on different levels. I mentioned the trivia of the, the uh, clove. And in that line, same line of uh, culinary trivia, it was wartime, and there were meat shortages, and we ate a lot of shellfish. I could not pick up a live lobster and drop it into boiling water. But please picture the great Rosalind Turek in those days picking up a live lobster plopping him into hot water and thinking nothing of it. I think that's pretty amusing. <laughs> it was a complete learning experience. It was not easy because I was still practicing. I very fortunately had been hired to Manus because it was immediately post-World War II and there were getting to be little children born and wanting piano lessons. Uh, and I also had some other jobs out of the city. But I managed because, as you all know, there was something about her that was appealing, compelling, and irresistible. You couldn't say no when Rosalind wanted something. Because of my good fortune uh, at being hired at Manus, in which Rosalind herself took great pride, my 
ability to continue helping her, <clears throat> her and doing any research, of course, was finished. But the friendship continued to the end. It was bifurcated, the musical relationship was bifurcated by my being invited to Manus. But the friendship was forever. I have letters from her being on tour. I have a precious postcard from Australia. Now, what do you think she would have sent from Australia? If you really knew her, you'd say she would have sent, which she did, a close-up picture of the back view of a koala and wrote, isn't this a darling, cuddly animal? Nothing about the tour, nothing professional but that. <laughs> yeah. I would say determination. This answer is an extension of what I said a moment ago. She was going to be whom, who she became. I think there was never a question in her mind. She lived that way, and I think she taught that way, too. Her teaching was clear, exacting, and demanding. And that's the way she was as a person and of the people who worked with her. Uh, she gave a very sound, comfortable technical instruction. I can remember Summers practicing for hours on end, as she did all year, never being tired or feeling pain. Pianists I know wind up with an aching this or a broken that. Never, never, never a trouble with hands, ever. Um, I think that's determination is her main quality in personally and in her work. She was a force, F-O-R-C-E. A very great influence. Even though she was teaching me about the piano, and about music, not only Bach. When she first got a student in those days, she assigned a very Catholic repertoire. She asked me to read Freud's introductory lectures, a book of biographies called 12 Against the Gods, <clears throat> sorry, by William Bolitho. You can tell from the title what it was about. And the other was Fraser's The Golden Bough. Uh, I don't know whether people are aware of that now, but it was really a history of superstition and religion through the ages. In addition to which, she gave me as a gift, a history not of music, but of art. Years later, 1957 actually, She's the one who encouraged me to take my first trip to Europe, which I wanted to do, but about which I was a little hesitant for many good reasons. She said, you come ahead, you are welcome. She by this time lived in London, had a, a large, uh, I guess it was a duplex in London. You are welcome to stay in my flat as long as you wish or to use it as a base for making trips to Europe. And what's more, you could then come with me to Holland. I'm playing in the Holland Festival. And a beautiful thing happened there. She had two performances in the small hall of the Concertgebouw. Maybe one was a mixed recital of Bach. And I know the other was a concerto with orchestra. But on Sunday morning at 11, when most people would be going to church. She played the Goldberg Variations in a hall in Steveningen, which is right on the sea. 
And people emerged from that concert as though they had been to church. We couldn't talk. We went and sat by the seaside. I think there was some brunch, and it doesn't much matter whether or not there was brunch. That was it. So she then went back to England, and I took off on my first tour of Europe, and um, she was the spur. Well, in the end, I believe it will be enormous. I'm sorry to say that she had a difficult time not being taken as the odd one. In going through these letters that I mentioned before, I found two clippings from the New York Times, which I don't ever remember having read, let alone clipped. They were from March of 1942. I'm not sure why, but Rosalind wrote a letter to the editor about not only the possibility, but her managing to play the Goldberg variations on one keyboard. She explains what she did, what she did why it's possible, how it can be done by others. The response to that was so antagonistic. There was a letter from Isidore Philippe. Again, perhaps you younger people don't remember, he was one of the great pianists of the early part of the century. And he headed his letter, In Defense of Busoni, with apparently with whom he had studied and whom he knew. And he was defending Busoni's transcriptions, which Roslyn had not disrespectfully, but matter-of-factly, shall I say, criticized. And it was a very nasty letter. And another response was from the harpsichordist, who was then not so famous, but became so, Ralph Kirkpatrick, who again didn't even mention her by name. But that lady, or that young lady, needn't be so boastful about being able to manage on uh, one keyboard. And I think he also questioned the sound of the Goldbergs on the piano. And incidentally, in Rosalind's letter, she uh, paid homage to Wanda Landowska, the great harpsichordist, now, we know today that Landowska played Bach in the French style, but in those days, Kirkpatrick was not well known at all. I'd never heard of him, but Roslyn insisted I go and hear Landowska when she played in town hall every year and take a score and make notes. And I still have the score in which I made notes. So. That's what professionals thought, that is famous professionals thought. Her so-called peers, or even elders, because at this time she was still in her upper 20s, really questioned her scholarship and her artistry. I remember people asking why I wanted to study with her. I never studied with anybody else, and I'm glad I didn't. It took a long time for her to gain respect. And I must say, as an American, I'm ashamed, she gained it first in Europe. Now, the Institute will certainly perpetuate her achievements. So I have no concern about that. But I really am saddened in remembering the beginning. I did that the last time we spoke, just days before she died. I just give her a big hug.
In late 2001, uh, uh, my company, Video Artists International, who had released a number of Rosalind Turek CDs and videos, asked me to drop off some CDs as Rosalind had just returned to the United States and was in Mount Sinai uh, for a checkup. And so I just dropped off the, the, the discs and uh, we hit it off like a uh, uh, house of fire. And in fact, uh, Sharon Isman was there too, so it was just a delightful evening. And then I started like being, uh, doing more and more things uh, uh, towards the last two years of her life. Uh, Rosalind could be, well, she was a strong lady. Uh, I knew her really at the end when she was obviously uh, not at a physical peak, but she came across to me as always very strong. She knew what she wanted. Um, and she always had something, she, she was very strong in her beliefs. And one just had to respect that. One could disagree. And she liked to argue, you know, to, to have a dialogue. But she knew what she believed in and believed in it strongly. Her honesty. The, the woman was honest in her opinions and, her, and in her feelings. And um, that, was, that made a big impression on me. One noun or one adjective? Uh, there's so many that pop into my mind, but I will go with uh, strong. She was a strong person. I believe that in the future, her position will be very strong. Um, there, as more and more things are appearing uh, with Roslyn in terms of uh, videos, the master classes, um, pretty much the, her recorded legacy. Um, and as more and more people know about her, I believe her legacy will be stronger. Uh, it actually is strong in the Far East and in Russia. There are, are big, big pockets of people who obviously tell me that Rosalind Turek was a big influence on their musical career. Um, in the future, though, anybody that knows Rosalind will only have to know where from her recordings and her videos. And um, because she did, she did start recording. Her first recordings actually go back to 1940 when she made four sides for RCA Victor. Um, these sides seem to have disappeared off the face of the earth completely. Um, she recorded sporadically, first for a small label called Allegro, which went out bankrupt about two years later. And then, of course, she did her uh, legendary uh, first recording of The Well-Tempered for American Decca, and then EMI signed her, and she later recorded for Columbia, now Sony, and then Deutsche Grammophon. Um, Deutsche Grammophon, I know, has pretty much kept her recordings in print. And VAI, who I work for, have released a number of Rosalind Turek's live performances where I believe she was actually at her best when she could communicate before an audience. But her, leg her musical or performance legacy is, is still living today and will be around for a long time to come. I would probably ask her, well, actually, for, for my personal point, I would ask her why she didn't record more. <laughs> I mean, there, there's a lot she didn't record, and I know she, she knew the music, and uh, I would just love to hear her play it. My first encounter with Rosalind Turek was on October 24, 1966. And the reason I remember this is I still have the program for the recital that she gave at Princeton University during my freshman year. And voila, I brought it with me. My first real encounter with Rosalind took place three years later. I was already doing 
classical radio shows on WPRB Princeton. And Rosalind fascinated me because one of my first records was one of Rosalind's records, her recording on Allegro of the Ouverture à la Manière Française, the, if you will, the companion to the concerto according to the Italian taste in Clavier Übung, Volume 2. But <clears throat> I, those days I was a purist. And here was this indomitable lady proselytizing at a time when it was already beginning to be unfashionable, if not solidly unfashionable, Bach on the piano. So I said to myself, the best way to deal with this is to find out if Rosalind Turek will agree to sit for an interview for, WP, for my show on WPRB. I wrote a letter to her in care of Cami. I got relatively quick response, all things being equal, because it was July when I wrote to her. And <clears throat> she was most agreeable to it, but we had to go to her. She couldn't come to Princeton, fine. A member of the Princeton faculty with whom I was friendly, a wonderful professor of electrical engineering named Foreman Acton, who was musically inclined, said, not a problem, Terry, I'll drive you up to Pound Ridge, because Rosalind still had the house in Pound Ridge, Chagan Noor. I can see her now. We arrived at the appointed time. I rang the doorbell. Rosalind came to the door. She was wearing a canary yellow velvet house dress that went right to the floor. Her hair was totally in disarray. And she said, oh good, you're here, just in time to help me pick curtain material. So before we sat down to do the interview, uh, Foreman and I communed with her about some patterns for some curtain material because she needed some new curtains for one of the rooms at Chagan Noor, which I, it was a wonderful glass house. It was on five acres of property of which four and a quarter acres were a lake. So <clears throat> that was the beginning and set up the tape recorder, started the interview. And I have to say within five minutes, the Methodist minister's grandson and the daughter of Turkish Jews knew we were going to be thick as thieves. And we were from then on. It was within the scope of that interview, she and I became close friends. It was absolutely marvelous. It is something, a memory I will treasure for all of my life. Rosalind asked no more of anybody else than she asked of herself. As anyone who knew her well will tell you, she could have had 100 people working for her 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and she still would have had more for them to do. That was just the way she was built. She was committed, she was, if you will, driven. But she always said, please. She always said, thank you. And she took tremendous joy in the relationships that were close to her, the people that she bonded with, to use, if you will, a trendy expression. And I think that's basically the best way I can describe Rosalind as a person. And of course, the, if you will, the sad aspect of that is that it is a side of Rosalind that the general public never saw from the stage. Because as you know, she went out onto the stage, she sat down, she got to the business at hand, and that was her commitment at that given moment. Her commitment was to putting out for the benefit of the people who had paid to come to hear her the best possible performance that she could give under the circumstances. And I think this is also one of the reasons why many people think of Rosalind Turek as a person who was humorless, and that is absolutely incorrect. No one liked to laugh more than Rosalind did, and I know this from personal experience because I took her one night to hear Peter Schickele do P.D. Kubach, 
And at one point, Rosalind was laughing so hard, she slipped out of the chair onto the floor. We had to pick her up back into the chair. And after it was over, she said to me, Terry, I want to go to the green room. And of course, I know Peter. Uh, and he'd been a guest on my radio show at WBAI back in the Guten Alten Zeit. So up the stairs we go. This was before they renovated Carnegie Hall. And the two things that I remember, one was the look of utter shock and terror when Peter saw that Rosalind Turek was in the line. And the other was the expression of total relief and total joy when Rosalind just was effusively over the top at how great the satire was, what all the hidden inner jokes were. And as I said, that part of Rosalind is something that the average person never saw. And sadly, in the videos, at least that I've seen, it's a part of her that does not sadly bubble to the surface. I have got more than one to share with you. The first, October 10th, 1977. There's a reason why I remember the date. Rosalind had, and I mean, this was a Turek tour de force, had scheduled a double performance of the Goldberg Variations in Carnegie Hall. The harpsichord performance took, began, I think, at 6, then there was a dinner break, and we reconvened, I think, at 8.40. Whatever, I have that information elsewhere. I also have a recording of those performances because Rosalind not only allowed me to have it pirated, but also she provided the seats. So the problem was that Carnegie Hall, which seats 2,200 people, um, is much vaster than the kind of room in which a harpsichord usually is played. So she had decided that it needed to be amplified, and a speaker was put this was a, as a result of discussions that she and I had. I said, you can't put the speaker anywhere other than underneath the instrument so that the sound from the speaker is coming from the same location as the sound from your dowd, your double manual dowd. So Rosalind asked me to come the day before, which was the recital was October 11th, on October 10th so that we could do what we could to make sure that the amplified harpsichord sounded natural, no matter where you were in Carnegie Hall. And Stuart Warkow, bless his heart, who was at the time the manager of Carnegie Hall, was also deputized. Remember, Rosalind used to say, be an angel. <laughs> and that meant that she had something for you to do. So he and I were running up, down, everywhere in uh, Carnegie Hall. Uh, now, it doesn't, it sounds amplified, it sounds disembodied up here, and of course, trying to judge it in an empty hall, what it was gonna sound like when the hall was full, all of these sorts of things. Well, this, we spent the better part of two and a half, three hours. So, we finish everything, we're all satisfied, and Rosalind turned to me and said, Terry, disappear for an hour, and then come back, please. So I went up to the New York Athletic Club, had a short workout in the gym, and came back. And she said to me, Terry, dear, take any seat in the hall. I feel like running through them. So I took a seat in the middle of row H. And for an hour and a half, I was Hermann Karl, Count von Keiselink, and she was Johann Sebastian Bach. You stop and think about if you were to try and, if you will, create that situation and to create it in Carnegie Hall, to hear the Goldberg variations played one-on-one -on -one the way they were intended originally to be played, and the cost of it, Rosalind Turek's fee, the rental fee for Carnegie Hall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it would be mind-boggling. And it was marvelous. And I said to her afterwards, Rosalind, if only I had had my little dictating machine with me to take it down. She looked at me and smiled and she said, Terry, dear, there are some performances that are destined not to be recorded. And there are two other quickies that I'd like to tell. 
One of them concerns my mother, who never met Rosalind, but they talked frequently on the telephone. Rosalind knew, this was obviously in the days before mobile phones were developed, if Rosalind had lived in the day of the mobile phone, none of us would have been safe from her. She would have found us anywhere we were at, except if we were out of range. Rosalind knew that if she couldn't find me at the phone numbers that she had, that the one person who would know was my mother, so she'd call the house in Greenwich. And I remember I got off the train one Saturday morning, and my mother, got, my mother was picking me up, and my mother said to me, tell me, did uh, Miss Turek find you? And I said, yes, yeah, she found me last night, so I, I'm something I'm going to see her on Monday. And she looked at me and she said, you know, Miss Turek said to me that you would do things for her that you wouldn't do for me. Well, I hesitated before I answered, and my mother said, and she said you'd hesitate before you answered that question. The other, another unforgettable image in my mind is the afternoon that Rosalind called me and said, busy tonight? I said, no, Rosalind, why? She said, I feel like going to the movies. I said, what are we seeing? The new documentary about Idi Amin. Oh, she said, yes, dear. It is important that every now and again we remind ourselves that evil can take on many guises. I have to visit. And we went and saw that movie and came out of it, you know, sort of in a semi-state of shock. And she said to me, you see what I mean? I said, I agree with you 100%. And finally, there was the time I took her to see Cats. And here we are in this Andrew Lloyd Webber show. We'll have a wonderful time watching it. And she's leaning over to me and she said, he stole that from Pulak. That comes from Shostakovich. That sounds like Rachmaninoff. Well, afterwards, she took me to the theater. I took her over to Barbetta for dinner. And it was late, so the place was basically empty. And Rosalind and I were sitting at one, in one corner, and in the other corner, there was a young couple. Uh, the woman had bleached blonde hair. And I had a big Canon SLR with me, a single leg, re, lens reflex, which I sort of was playing with. It was on the table. And I saw the man at the table in the other corner gesture for the captain, who was a six foot seven inch tall, uh, chap we called Giovanino, Little John. And Giovanino went over and there was a conversation. The rest of the meal went on, they left. And Giovanino came over to the table and I said to him, I said, Giovanino, what was that man so upset about? And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Tao, didn't you recognize them? I said, no, I had no clue, except she needs to find a good hairdresser. He said, that was Sean Penn and Madonna. And of course, everybody knew at the time that Sean Penn, you know, was trashing paparazzi and all this sort of thing. And I said, oh, Lord, what did you say to them? I, he said, it was very simple, Mr. Tao. I explained to them that you are one of the restaurant's regular customers, the signorina's lawyer, and that the lady that you are with has been much more famous than Madonna is for many more years. <laughs> Absolutely unforgettable. Her strongest character trait was total commitment. When she made up to her mind that she was going to do something, she did it. And that from the, from the anecdotal history, you know, going to Olga Samarov with another Prelude and Fugue and having memorized it and just putting the music down and playing it. Um, when she set out on a project, it was total unswerving commitment. There also, which is something a lot of people didn't see, a remarkable warmth in the lady. Generosity, quiet generosity, quiet appreciation, quiet support, you know, emotional support when you needed it, that sort of thing. And these things would sometime come together. And one of the ways that manifested itself is, you know, uh, she was a clavichord player. And it's the side of her that the world never heard. And I remember the commitment she'd be working on when she was working on the preludes and fugues from the well-tempered clavier for the series that she did for the BBC in the 70s when she was living on East 68th Street. I remember more than one occasion 
We'd been out to dinner, and I walked her back to 215 East 68, and she said, Terry, dear, I feel like playing the clavichord. So I would pull up a chair beside the golf, and she'd play until 4 o'clock in the morning. And it was the combination of the commitment, because what I realized she was doing was working out issues, interpretive issues, at the clavichord to be prepared to translate them to the piano. And at the same time, she was showing me an ultimate generosity, knowing how much I adored her playing, by letting me be a fly on the wallpaper. The adjective is formidable. The noun is genius. Well, as far as general influence is concerned, it was through Rosalind that indirectly I met more people in the musical world in New York than through anyone else. We had been to hear George Bolette give a recital in Carnegie Hall, and as you may know, George Bolette, Earl Wilde, and Rosalind were all classmates together at Juilliard. After this recital of George Bolette's, we went to the green room, and we had greeted Mr. Bolette, and we were standing talking, and a man walked into the room wearing a lavender tuxedo jacket. And Rosalind looked at me and said, Terry, you must know Joe Maclis. And she didn't mean in the sense that surely I had met this man. She meant it in the sense that this is someone you need to know. And Joe, of course, who wrote the famous textbook, The Enjoyment of Music, if there was anybody in this world that didn't know Joe, it was their fault, not his. And through Rosalind, I got to know Joe, and through Joe, I met so, so many people in the world of music, the world of culture, Hirschfeld, Alger Hiss, Sulema Stravinsky, Stella Adler, the list is endless. And I always attribute this to Rosalind because I may have met Joe Maclis in another context, but Rosalind took me over and said, Joe, I want you to meet this friend of mine, Terry Tao. And that was the beginning. Musically, Rosalind expanded my horizons. In the course of that interview that I recorded with her in 1969, in the course of conversations, she opened windows for me. I began to understand why it is. This is something I learned also from Pablo Casals and from William H. Scheide, the founder of the Bach Aria Group, that it is the substance of the performance that is important not the form that it takes. In other words, if, as Casals, uh, in essence, would have put it, if the performance is well executed and it moves you, it's good music. If the performance does not move you, no matter how well executed it is and on whatever instrument it is, it is bad music. And Rosalind was committed to making the best possible music. And also, she expected the listener to meet her on the same level. She didn't just serve them a meal. They ex she expected the listener to meet her on the same level, to invest as much energy and thought and commitment into listening to it as she was putting in to making the performance possible. As far as scholarship was concerned, and Rosalind was every inch a scholar, Rosalind was fortunate to be a member of the last generation of independent scholars who were tolerated by academia. If you detect a certain amount of sarcasm in that statement, it is deliberate, because I am one generation too young. There are too many people out there with PhDs fighting for jobs to want 
to do anything to give an independent scholar who has not osculated the correct glutei maximi and who has not got the correct string of abbreviations after his or her name uh, a place in the spectrum. She worked independently. She listened very carefully to what the acknowledged scholars had to say. If they were correct and she wasn't, she acknowledged it. If she felt they were incorrect, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And of course, acknowledged scholars don't like it when someone who isn't a member of the community discovers something that they'd overlooked. And of course, the classic example of that was when Rosalind noticed that little embellishment that Sebastian Bach wrote into measure 17 of the Andante in the Italian concerto uh, and started to embellish that line. What this, the acknowledged scholars, the backing and filling that they did to try and make it look like they had realized this before she discovered it was amusing to witness. And of course, the other aspect of it, which was great fun, was I worked with her on the preparation of her introduction for that published edition of the Italian concerto that she did as a result of that. And she decided, quite rightly, that the original print should be reproduced in the introduction. And I looked at the printed score that she had and noticed that there had been a correction made. And I showed her the differences. She looked at it and she said, you know, I'd never noticed that. And of course, Rosalind went to that original text, no longer accepting the quote unquote corrections to make things symmetrical that generation after generation of scholars has, have made. As she said, don't ever forget that symmetry is not a Baroque concept. So to the best of my knowledge, her last recording of the concerto according to the Italian taste, the so-called Italian concerto, is the only commercial recording with Bach's exact text observed, plus, of course, Rosalind's marvelous <laughs> embellishments. She was somebody who was, in a way, at the same time, behind her time and way ahead of it. And if, it, if the musical result did not satisfy her, she didn't care. I remember with respect to the chromatic fantasia in Fugue, in the chromatic fantasia, the second of the opening flourishes has a piano indication under it in almost all the sources. She plays them both at essentially the same volume. I asked her why, and she said, because I don't like it piano the second time around. <laughs> Absolutely, that's part of the compact between a composer and a performer, and it's something that Rosalind understood very well. As far as posterity is concerned, people are already beginning to come around. I was talking with uh, a very uh, distinguished uh, harpsichordist before the public t today on the telephone day before yesterday, Skip Sempay, whom you happen to know. And we were talking about how the younger generation of pianists is coming around to Landowska for Haydn and Mozart. And I said, yes, and Rosalind Turek for Johann Sebastian Bach. He said, most, de most decidedly so. Uh, Rosalind's approach because of its sincerity and, if you will, lack of egocentricity is timeless in a way that, and I know this will horrify people because I'm saying it, but I believe it, in a way that Glenn Gould's will not. Glenn Gould will sound very dated in 50 years. Rosalind Turek will sound timeless. You know, you asked, what is the first time you met Rosalind Turek? And what is, to me, an equally cogent question, because we never know when, it, when it's going to happen, when was you the last time that you saw her? And the 
there are two parts to this. First is the last time, what turned out to be the last time that she and I ever went out to uh, have a meal together. It was in October of 2001, as I recall. She had just come back to New York. We met for lunch at Barbetta. It was a warm October, early October afternoon. So we ate in the garden. And I remember Rosalind coming down the steps with a cane. It's the first time I ever saw her with a cane. And I said to her when she walked in, without the need of the cane, I said, what are you doing with that cane? She said, protection. And I said, Rosalind, the reason you have that cane is to swap people with it if they get in your way. She laughed. We went to the table. And I had with me something that was, if you will, a recent recognition of mine, which was what remains of the legendary lost portrait of Johann Sebastian Bach, the portrait that belonged to his pupil, Kittel. And Rosalind was very, very, very particular about images of Johann Sebastian Bach. And when Bill Buckley sent her a replica of the portrait in Erfurt that is supposed to show Johann Sebastian Bach as a young man, she sent it back with a note, as she told me, that read, what, Bach with an aquiline nose? Question mark. And of course, he did that painting as a forgery, by the way, which I've demonstrated. I took out the original of the Kittel portrait, which I happened to have at the time in my possession, thanks to the generosity of its owners. I showed it to her. She bonded with it instantly. And I had the camera. It's just a marvelous picture. And it's the last time I uh, ate with her. But what is particularly touching for me personally is our piece, obviously, was the Goldberg Variations. Aria, 30 Variations, Aria da Capo. We, the first time I actually quote unquote met Rosalind Turek at Chagan Noor was to interview her. Two days before what turned out to be her last birthday, I went up to the apartment in Riverdale to record another interview for which was to, to be converted into a print interview for Goldberg, Mary, Goldberg Mary magazine. And of course, unfortunately, Goldberg went belly up. It would have been wonderful to have had that in there. It was, that turned out to be the last time that I saw her. Because I called her several weeks later. It's the only time I ever heard fear in her voice. And she said, Terry, I can't talk to you. I'm on the way to the doctor. Clunk. And I said, something is not right. And of course, the rest of it we all know. And that afternoon, when we did that interview, we finished the interview, and as I left, believing that she'd been born, by the way, on December 14th, 1914, not as we know now, a year earlier, I said, Rosalind, in two days, you will be 88. One year for every key on a Steinway. Now you go for the Russian extensions. As you know, a Russian piano has 92 keys. And she said, no, dear. And then she did something which only she had the privilege of doing, tugged on my beard and said, I'm going for an imperial Bösendorfer, which has 100 keys. And sadly, it was not to be. But on that afternoon, December 12, 2002, I had no doubt that it would happen. Sadly, it didn't. But of course, the recordings live on. What I would say is, Rosalind, dear friend, thank you, thank you, thank you, because the gifts that you gave me keep on giving day in and day out. One of the things that she taught me that is an eternal gift 
is the fact that music is horizontal, not vertical. And too many performances nowadays, it's as though each measure, each beat in a measure, is being sliced off equally by one of those slices that they have in a delicatessen when you get the roast beef. And Rosalind had the ability to convey this meaning. She taught me so much about how to respond to music. If she were to walk into this room at this moment, I'd get up, I'd give her a big hug and say, Rosalind, thank you. It's a gift that keeps on giving. I was so, so lucky to have this wonderful woman take me into her life. Forgive me, I'm a little emotional, but that's, hey, she was a treasured friend and still is. In 1977, I was a student at Yale University as an undergraduate, and I decided I really needed a teacher. There was no guitar teacher there, and I felt that Bach was the one weak point in my repertoire. So I looked in the phone book, found her name listed in New York, called her up, and said, I'd like to be your student. She actually said, well, let's try one lesson and see how it goes. So I went to New York, had a lesson with her, she said, yes, I'll take you on as a student. And for the next year, we worked on one suite of the four Bach Lute suites. That was uh, 996. And each time I'd come to a lesson, I think we would move on. But we just moved on to the next level. And it was really remarkable work. Rosalind Turek could be a very, very warm, loving, giving, generous human being. And that's the person that I knew. She also had a great sense of humor. She was very demanding of herself and expected no less of anybody else. So the fact that she was a perfectionist with others was only because she expected that of herself. I remember one time she was describing her experience back in the 1950s when she was invited to conduct the Philharmonia Orchestra in London in Festival Hall. And she walked into the first rehearsal and saw the sea of men, and she thought, oh my goodness, how are they going to take me as a woman? They haven't had a female conductor before. So she started to work, especially with the, the principal flutist, a lot on embellishment. They were doing the, the Brandenburg Number no. 5. And after a little while, the concertmaster got very jealous. He stood up and he said, why are you spending all this time with the flutist and not with me? And she could sense the tension building, and this was going to be a, a, a doom or succeed moment. So she looked at everybody and she said, well, if the truth be told, I prefer blondes. And everybody burst out laughing and they were just great after that. And there was another time when this was actually a very sad moment. Uh, she was on her deathbed basically. And I was visiting her and I had just done a recording with the Zurich Chamber Orchestra and it included a work that she had arranged especially for this recording, and she'd never heard the recording before. So I played it for her at her bedside, and I was, of course, just miserable at thought of my dear mentor dying, and it was just a very sad, difficult moment. And all of a sudden, she bolted up in bed, and she said, the G, where's the G? And I thought, oh, great, here's, here's the Turek that I know and love, she's back. When you think of Rosalind Turek, you think of perfection. You think of magnificent rhythm. You think of an ear that is beyond that of most mortal human beings. You think of someone who has really delved beneath the surface to the depths of musicality that, and scholarship that we can't even conceive of in order to produce what she did, which was on such a high level. So I think of her as someone with enormous discipline, with enormous uh, perfectionism, but in a good way, and great, great passion. And that was one of the rare combinations of her as a scholar and as a performer. She was able to bring both of those skills to the fore, great scholarship and magnificent 
passionate performance. She's like, she was a goddess. I mean, if I had to describe Rosalind Turk with one word, that's, it's impossible. But to me, a goddess is someone who encompasses everything, someone who has the depth of humanity, the depth of her professionalism, her artistry. She was a great, great artist. And in every sense of the word, that's what she projected. I think anybody who goes to study with Rosalind Turek begins in a very naive way to think that they know something. And they discover very quickly they know very little. So what I learned from her was discipline in a way that I'd never experienced before, and the need to really pursue the musical ends to the very final nth degree. There, of course, is no final degree. We're always striving, we're always growing, we're always creating. But to never be satisfied and to always probe for more and to be a perfectionist, that's what she taught me. Well, Rosalind Turek transformed the whole concept of interpretation and understanding of Bach in a historical context. And she brought to the fore the tools of Baroque performance practice that would be necessary for those of us for generations to come to understand and to learn in order to interpret the music of Bach. So for that, I will always be grateful that I was able to study with her for 10 years and benefit from her lifetime of experience. And now for me to share that with others, I recorded all the Bach Lutz suites that we edited together, published them with G. Shermer, and have been able to leave behind both a, a legacy on paper and uh, on recording so that others can learn from that as well. And what she brought to the keyboard was a whole new technique, which transformed the ability to play Bach and of course, with the knowledge and scholarship of embellishment, articulation, dynamics, phrasing, structure, structure was always at the core of everything that informed her interpretive decisions. I would want to tell her thank you and that I love her. <laughs>